you want some grounding, you want grounding in senses. And also you really do need for general intelligence, you, did, you do need some kind of a vision. It doesn't need to have the same you know, sense acuity as humans necessarily, but you do need vision, I, I think, to have a sense of 2D, 3D world and also action movement. I think there'll be a time when it becomes really, really obvious to pretty much anybody who works with a system saying, wow, this is the real thing. It really can learn by itself, you know, and it still needs a bit more. How long will it take us to get there? Well, I usually answer that question. It's not a matter of time. It's a matter of money. Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. This week, I talked to Peter Voss, a longtime researcher in the field of artificial general intelligence. He was one of the authors of a book titled Artificial General Intelligence, which helped popularize the term. And Peter has a company called iGo.ai, A-I-G-O dot A-I which builds intelligent chatbots for industry. But Peter's real ambition is to build artificial general intelligence using cognitive architectures and graph knowledge bases, a strategy very different from the pre-trained transformer architectures in use today and which many commentators have argued we'll never get us to AGI. I hope you find this conversation as fascinating as I did. This episode is sponsored by Datastax, the real-time AI company. With Datastax, any enterprise can mobilize real-time data and quickly build smart, high-growth applications at unlimited scale on any cloud. Companies building real-time generative AI apps can leverage the Datastax vector search capabilities to build LLMs, AI assistants, and more. Sign up now at the link in our show notes. I'm Peter Voss. I'm CEO and Chief Scientist of iGo.ai. And I got into AI, um, actually, it's quite a long journey. I started off as an electronics engineer started my own electronics company, then fell in love with software and my company turned into a software company. I developed a comprehensive ERP software package and that company was quite successful. We went from the garage to 400 people and did an IPO. So that was great fun and, um, you know, learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes and uh, made some money. And it, when I exited that company, it really occurred to me what project do I want to tackle now? And it's, you know, it was obvious that software is not very smart by itself, that it makes mistakes. If a programmer doesn't think of something, it'll just crash or give you an error message or something. So that software really doesn't have common sense. It can't reason. So that's what I embarked on more than 20 years ago to figure out how to bring intelligence to software. So I took a five years to study all sorts of aspects, all different aspects of intelligence, uh, starting with um, epistemology, theory of knowledge. How do we know anything? What is reality? How can we be sure of things? And, you know, things of that nature. And then also about cognition is what do IQ tests measure? How do children learn? How does our intelligence differ from animals? And, you know, things like that to really deeply understand what intelligence is all about. I obviously also studied work that had already been done in the field of, of AI. And then and by 2001, I was ready to start my own AI company. Um, and we spent several years basically doing R&D, taking the, the ideas that I'd formulated and turning them into actual code, into an actual framework, uh, which we subsequently commercialized in a company called Smart Action to automate phone calls intelligently basically with a brain. And um, my current company is basically the second generation of this technology. We took some more time to crank up the IQ of the system and current company, iGo AI, we call it a, a chatbot with a brain, as opposed to all of the other chatbots out there that really don't have a brain. And that's where I am today. And, and really the mission I'm on is to develop AGI to develop full human level uh, general intelligence. 
Yeah. Uh, and uh, we spoke last time. IGO is based on uh, knowledge graphs. It's not a neural net or a deep learning uh, model. Is that right? And, yes, and when you, mm -hmm. just when you talk about a, a, the, a brain, a chatbot with a brain, the brain, you're really referring to the uh, knowledge graph database. Is, is that right? Well, the knowledge graph is only one part of it. It's a very important part of it, but it's really the, the substrate of our brain. It's how short-term and long-term memory are encoded, you know, that all of the knowledge and skills are encoded in a, it, uh, I look at it as much as a neural network, but in the sort of original traditional sense, uh, as as well as a knowledge graph. So it's a combination, uh, you know, it's nodes and links that mm. basically encode relationships between concepts. Um, it's very, very different from what almost everybody else in the field of AI is working on. So what most people are working on is statistical AI or more recently generative AI, which is basically big data, big compute, you know, number crunching, building these large read only models. And, and that's really where, you know, all the visible progress has been, been made and all the money has been made and all the oxygen has been sucked out of the air with that approach, basically a statistical big data approach. Whereas, um, my approach, our approach has, has really from day one been a cognitive AI. So the starting point is what does intelligence require? So the, the, the knowledge graph that uh, is, as I say, the sort of substrate of our brain uh, just encodes the knowledge and skills that it has. But the, the, the various algorithms and capabilities that the system has as, you know, deep understanding, deep parsing, uh, context, reasoning, you know, short-term memory, long-term memory, uh, language generation, uh, you know, all the various skills that the system has, they basically work uh, either part of the skill set that is in the knowledge graph or they are additional algorithms that, that work on the knowledge graph. So the brain itself really is, it's a cognitive architecture that has all of the components required for cognition. Yeah. On cognitive architectures, maybe you can talk a little bit about that uh, uh, and what they are and what some of the popular architectures are and what architecture you use. Yes. Um, so cognitive architectures have actually been around for quite a long time for, you know, 30 or more years. Um, but, and, and they, they sort of, a lot of them are based, well, they're different camps. Some of them are based on, really logic programming on, you know, logic inference and, and, and uh, having um, logic as their base. Others really started off with biology and saying sort of neural networks and, you know, how does the brain work and can we, can we simulate that in, in a cognitive architecture? But the, the, the common denominator is, is basically the cognitive architecture um, tries to embody all of the requirements for cognition. So it's typically, you know, input, there's input processing, and then there's output, and that, that loop is, is closed, and then there might be some higher level reasoning uh, involved. Now, you know, when, when I mention cognitive architectures, people often say, well, we've tried that for 30 years, and it hasn't worked, you know. But of course, go back 10 or 15 years and sure. people would have said exactly the same thing about neural networks you know hey we've tried neural networks for 30 years and they haven't worked well sometimes uh, things don't work until they do and um, there are actually several reasons i think why um, cognitive architectures haven't come to the forefront uh, one of one of them already mentioned is that the success of statistical big data approaches has, has, you know, it has been so successful that it sucked all of the oxygen out of the air. And basically, if you want to get something funded, it's got to be, you know, statistical AI. Uh, if if you want to write, get a PhD, it's that. If you want to earn big bucks, that's really what the fields you have to work in. So I think cognitive architectures have suffered from, from that. But also they have been, I, I believe, um, two sort of technical aspects that we've overcome that I think have hampered them. And one of them is the knowledge representation itself of, you know, what we refer to the knowledge graph or knowledge representation. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, really has to be of super high performance. And we benchmarked our knowledge graph against uh, graph databases, sta state of the art graph databases, and we are literally three orders of magnitude faster, a thousand mm -hmm. times faster. So something that'll take one second of our, our system to compute and respond to, you know, involving a, a knowledge graph, uh, would take a thousand seconds. And of course, that doesn't make it viable at all, you know, in, in, for a, uh, an in interactive system. So, um, and, and related to that is that the various components that I, I mentioned, like deep passing, understanding, uh, short-term memory, uh, context, reasoning, and all of those need to be deeply integrated with each other and with the knowledge graph. So we developed all of these components ourselves from the ground up, whereas traditional, um, many of the traditional uh, uh, Cognitive architectures um, have a very modular approach, which you know, which is typically a good engineering approach. So you say, mm -hmm. "Hey, we need a parser, the Stanford parser. That's good parser. We'll use the Stanford parser. We need a knowledge uh, graph. We'll use some knowledge graph, and we need a reasoning engine. We'll use somebody's reasoning engine." Um, but the, the the overall system really suffers from that because cognition really requires these systems to work together. When you hear a sentence. It might require short-term memory to say, you know, say Bob's not coming along. Okay, did we talk about Bob or somebody related to Bob recently? No. Long-term memory, do we know what Bobs do we know? Reasoning, what kind of Bob would make sense with the context we're in? Well, it might be the, the family dog that's not coming along to the picnic next weekend, you know. So you, you really need to have this deep integration of all of the different components for cognitive architecture, I think, to work effectively. Um, we've actually sp spoken to, you know, R&D teams at, uh, you know, various large companies at, at Microsoft and Oracle and so, where they've tried to... Uh, integrate uh, <clears throat> graph databases in, into their language systems, and they just couldn't get them to work because of this um, performance and integration issue. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, the uh, Yeah, so, it, it, so that's IGO. Uh, you start mm -hmm. with uh, a model that you've pre-trained on a certain amount of, of data that gives it uh, uh, an understanding of uh, basic relationships and language is that right? And then uh, the the company or or person using it, as they use it, uh, they add to the knowledge base uh, or to the knowledge graph through through their discussion or their yeah. questions and answers. Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, I can probably best illustrate that, you know, with uh, one of our customers because they are really logically three layers. Physically, they, they're all, all the same, but logically they separate into three layers. Um, you know, one of our big customers is 1-800-Flowers group of companies, Harry and David and Popcorn Factory and so on. And they wanted a hyper-personalized con concierge type personal assistant, you know, for each of their 20 million customers potentially. So we have the, the core knowledge base of our system that basically knows about people and places and how to start a conversation and, you know, how to, to reason and basically to handle language, sort of a core competency. Um, you know, you could equate that taking somebody sort of just starting college or something. Of course, it doesn't have the broader knowledge base, but, you know, converse, conversational knowledge. Yeah. And then um, for each particular company, we then add the next knowledge layer, the ontology or knowledge layer required for that company. You know, what are the products for that company? What are their business rules? And the integration to uh, APIs to their backend system is also handled at that, at that layer where you can dynamically get, you know, the customer's order status or their, their history or, or whatever, which may be processed on, on another system. So the, the knowledge graph can basically integrate dynamically for um, company-specific things. And then the, the third layer is per individual customer of what you learn uh, in interacting with a the customer. They might tell you, you know, I, I, I want to buy uh, a present for my, my sister's anniversary. 
And then the system will remember that for that customer and potentially be able to, to, to use, utilize it, you know, if there's a follow-up question or next year or whatever the, the, the case may be. So it's basically the, the core knowledge and skills that are available to all of our, all users of our system, then the company specific knowledge, um, APIs and capabilities. And then the third layer is for each individual user, what unique uh, information you you learn about them. Yeah, uh, how how large can so the 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 core model uh, doesn't grow in size, but the knowledge graph uh, grows in size. Correct, uh, and and that's housed in a in a graph database. How yeah. large can that get? Uh, is there is there a limit? Yeah, so. We, you know, currently all of the applications we do are text-based, so they're not image, they're no, no images. And you can really have a, a lifetime worth of conversation pretty much, you know, in, in a few megabytes. I mean, it's, it's, it's really um, not, not a problem. Um, you know, we've, we currently, I mean, compared to large language models, it's completely trivial, you know, whereas they're talking yeah. trillion parameters we're talking maximum a few million, you know, we simply don't need more than that for, for these particular applications. Now, for a more general AGI, of course, that will become much bigger. It'll be, you know, in the um, tens of millions, hundreds of millions um, range. Yeah, well, how do you get then from, from this uh, uh, to AGI? I mean, what? it's not simply a matter of scale. Uh, you you mentioned this right now is uh, a text base. Uh, you know we talked last time about Yan Lecun's, uh Jeppa architecture, and uh, he's he's right now he's working in still images, but uh, with an expectation to uh, move on to video, uh, where this architecture will build a a, a model of the world. Uh, based on on its input, uh, uh, unstructured yeah. uh, data input, uh, no labeling required or anything like that. Right. And to right. me, that you know, his argument against the pre-trained transformer architectures is that you know the knowledge that that they're dealing with is what's contained in human knowledge in language, but human uh, written human language. Human language contains a lot of, uh, you know, lies and falsehoods right. and, uh, you know, rhetorical uh, devices and things. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and so it'll never understand the underlying reality, whereas his architecture is learning uh, from uh, in much the way as, as a human would from uh, from what it's experiencing. And it sounds like your uh, cognitive architecture in IGO has that potential. I mean, can you talk about are there parallels with what Lacun is doing and what you're doing? Y yes, uh, yes, absolutely. In fact, our, our early um, development, our early prototypes that we, we built uh, had multiple sensors. In fact, we originally started off with a, a virtual critter, virtual mouse in a virtual environment that had mm -hmm. whiskers and ears and could smell things and, you know, virtual smell and, and all that. So um, I, I think it's very important. So I would definitely agree with that sentiment that you want, you want some grounding, you want grounding in sensors. And also you really do need for general intelligence, you, did, you do need some kind of a vision. It doesn't need to have the same you know, sense acuity as, as humans necessarily, uh, but you do need uh, you do need vision, I, I think, to have a sense of two D three three D world and and you know also action movement. So um, the, um, the the current project that we're working on that is directly aimed at going all the way to to human level intelligence is a version of our technology that again has vision included in it. Because I, I do believe that's that's important. As you know, mouse you can manipulate a mouse and keyboard and and uh, see uh, um, you know take in a, a desk whatever shown on a desktop. So I, I would agree with that. 
um, a for the for the grounding and uh, as you say for um, really the the tie to reality yeah, the, the the grounding now i i'm not totally up to date with his approach and i'm not sure if you know if he's published everything but uh typically um what everybody else is doing is is basically bulk training and uh, mm. i think one of the keys of intelligence is it has to absolutely be real-time incremental it has to be able to learn real-time incremental and and sort of much of it has to be one-shot learning um mm. you know for example you can show a, a, a child a photograph a single photograph of an elephant for the first time they've never seen one before and they'll be able to recognize you know pink elephants and upside down elephants and elephants in the wild and so on and the systems really need to be capable of doing it and, and all of the the big data efforts right now are talking about plowing more data into training and it's all bulk training you know that's why they cost spend a hundred million dollars or more and have to use chips that cost thirty thousand dollars you know per uh, uh gpu chip or you know uh, training chip um so I, I think that that's an important element uh, of being able to learn incrementally in real time yeah uh, and you mentioned earlier in um you know how how condensed uh, this data is of uh, if if only contained in language uh, and uh, i had heard and i'm trying to think whether it was you or someone had mentioned to me that they had spoken to someone who's developing a watch a device that would run 24 7 was it you that, that told no, me about no, this no I, it doesn't and, ring a bell no <laughs> right but uh and and so it you would wear it throughout your life and it would mm -hmm. it would continually pick up data uh mm -hmm. and and uh encode it into a model so mm -hmm. that over time you would end up with a virtual twin um yeah. is, is it's i've heard you talk about something similar with igo uh that uh yes. in, in, yeah yeah it's actually um i i had some friends that oh maybe 50, as long as 15 years ago were doing live logging where they basically have a camera um you know permanently attached recording everything and um but that seems to have fizzled you know i think one of the problems is also is how do you ever get back to it it's like people taking photographs of their their lunch and dinner and all sorts of things, you know, and they have tens of thousands of photographs. Do you ever look at them again, you know? <laughs> so, um, yes, I think what, what, uh, what we are doing, um, one of the, the aims is what we call a personal, personal assistant. And, uh, as I mentioned, it should really be called a personal, personal, personal assistant because three different aspects of the word personal, uh, it, um, um, you know, uh, really meaningful here. The one is, the first personal is that you own it. Uh, it's your property. You control it. It serves your purpose and not some mega corporations. You know, it's not like Siri or Alexa uh, that clearly, you know, you get them for free, but, you know, they, they don't serve your purpose uh, first and foremost. So that's the first thing that you own it. And the second personal is it's hyper-personalized to you. It gets to know your history, your likes, who you you know who you what type of things you buy, who your friends are, uh, and every, you know everything like that. So it can can do things for you. And the third personal is that the issue of privacy that you decide what it shares with whom. So certain things that may you may share with your spouse, other things with your coworkers, and you know some other things you share with Amazon. So that's the personal assistant. So I don't see it so much as a as a twin um recording everything you do but more in an extension or an exocortex eventually that you know you 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 can rely on it so much to give you advice to do things for you it's, it's like an expansion expansion of your of your own uh, mind of your own cortex yeah and how do you do that if you're this personal 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 assistant how would you gather that data is it uh that you know, someone would spend a certain amount of time every day 
uh, you know, through natural language, just inputting data? Or would it be, as I described, some device that, that captures data as you, as you move around? Well, it, it could be any number of ways. I mean, we are talking about something that really is at human level capability. So it if you wanted to, it could, you know, read your email, uh, past, past email goes through it and, you know, get to know things about you or anything else that you may have that it, that it can find out. But uh, to a large extent, it would be through interaction and things you ask it to do for you that it would pick up and ask for clarification, you know, uh, do you always want to fly with this airline? You know, is that something you prefer? Or, you know, what kind of hotels do you want to stay in? You know, and, and whatever it might be that it would learn through interaction. But as I say, potentially could, you know, read all of your Twitter or Facebook or email and uh, gather more information uh, from that. Yeah, uh, it's is uh, but but again, this is uh, a, a, is is that a, a, a model that you're working on? Uh, and that would be that's we're not talking about AGI there. We're talking about uh, just a really useful uh, uh, tool. No, I think uh, we are talking about AGI there. I mean, there there may be early versions of it which you know wouldn't qualify. Uh, but the work that we're doing right now is to expand our system uh, in the level of, uh, in, in a number of levels, A, in the sort of adaptability, meaning what it can learn. Um, uh, obviously, the capacity of how much it can learn, we are expanding, but that's more of an engineering challenge. And we're expanding the ability to reason. You know, for example, uh, theory of mind, our current system can't really reason about what the other person is thinking. So, you know, that's something we need to expand the capability of its higher levels of, of abstract uh, abstract thinking. Um, so it's really the, um, the, the cognitive abilities need to be cranked up. And then we need to teach our system a lot more general knowledge at the moment. Uh, that's, it's not a lot because, uh, you know, for the applications we do, it doesn't need to know about, you know, baby showers and different sporting events and traveling the world and, and, and stuff like that. It simply doesn't need to know that. But once you get to a, a personal assistant, um, you really want it to have that kind of general knowledge, that bad uh, knowledge about the world, about things. So it's, it's really scaling up the knowledge, scaling up the ability to learn autonomously. At the moment, there's still quite a bit of human in the loop for when the system learns. Um, so that, you know, will decrease as uh, its cognitive ability is, uh, cranks up. Um, but it's really the same architecture that we are, are using currently. It's just a matter of expanding it to be more general, more adaptive and more autonomous. Well, that's fascinating. The, um, um, the, 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 I'm sorry, I'm just seeing my batteries low. Um, I'll, I'll go for a few more minutes and then, uh, I'm going to have to run down and get my cord. Um, but the, um, uh, so it's the same architecture. How do you encode that knowledge? Uh, if, if you're, uh, I mean, there's a certain amount of label data at the very beginning of what is a verb, what is a noun, and and that sort of thing. Uh, but but as you move uh, into increasingly abstract uh, space, how how do you encode that knowledge? Yeah. So it's really the the important thing is that the system needs to be able to learn this, similar to the way a human does. So. It, it will learn about, you know, different instances, for example, of whether it's examples of people or, you know, places or activities. And then the cognitive ability uh, is able to do concept formation, is able to conceptualize this automatically and say, well, these things fit into this category and other things fit into a different category. And part of that is where we will give it a curriculum to encourage that kind of learning, similar to the way you would 
uh, you would a human to basically feed it information, give it examples, give it exercises to be able to build up this knowledge structure layer by layer. So the more fundamental uh, things are, you know, really solidly Im embedded, um, you know, like time and space, for, for example, need, you know, and comparisons of bigger and smaller and, and all of the different kinds of relationships. And then um, as, as it gets better at being able to learn autonomously, then it's basically a matter of uh, hitting external data sources like Wikipedia is an ob obvious one. And, you know, we've already done quite a bit of work in that area. Um, but this is also where large language models can actually help us, where we can, you know, extract information from them as long as you have a, a system that's smart enough to be able to uh, double check the information and see if it makes sense, if it makes sense to integrate it. Um, yeah, would, would, would you be able to avoid... Uh, the bias that exists in, in uh, you know, human databases like uh, on the internet generally? Yes, I, um, I mean, ultimately, you know, biases like that can, the, the best remedy for biases, uh, handling biases like that is ultimately rationality, that you say, is this really a relevant factor? You know, is race a relevant factor, you know, or... Um, you know, what, whatever it might be, is the background a relevant factor to achieve a particular objective? And, you know, humans aren't that good at it, but basically the more rational you are or the more rationality you apply to it, uh, the, the better you'll be at basically eliminating bias in, in your decision-making. Yeah, uh, and, and that idea of combining... Uh, large language models with uh, this cognitive architecture approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do you, do you think AGI, every, not everybody, but there are mm -hmm. several different uh, uh, initiatives to try and get there. And you wrote a big chunk of the original artificial general intelligence book, uh, with with a number of other, I mean Ben Gertzel and, and Shane Legg, they've gone off in their own directions, uh, working on AGI. Is is the do you think ultimately all of these different threads or or the most promising will come back and and intertwine, uh, or do you think uh, there is only one path? to AGI and one of you guys will find it? Or do you think that there are several paths and there will be different flavors of general intelligence? Yes. So I, I'm quite certain that it has to be something along the lines of cognitive AI, uh, though there are different ways of achieving it. For, for example, one could start with robotics, you know, a much more uh, grounded, embedded approach that the system learns through that. It certainly has its advantages, but also has big disadvantages of having to deal with the robotic aspects of it. Um, so I think there are different ways of getting there. But, you know, even Sam Altman and Demis Asabis of, of DeepMind have said quite clearly that large language models are not the way to AGI. Mm -hmm. They're a dead end. Yeah. So, and, but, they don't really have an alternative. You know, it's more at the moment, well, let's build bigger systems. Let's kind of see what happens, you know. But on the one hand, they recognize that it's a dead end. But on the other hand, they don't seem to really know how to solve the problem. And, you know, the the biggest impediment by far, well, there are several, but I would say the biggest one is that they are pre-trained, you know, GPT. They're generative, they make up stuff, which is not a good thing, uh, rather than to reason about things and, and have a solid knowledge base. Uh, they are P, pre-trained, which means they cannot really learn uh, once the model is built. So you to build a new model, you're talking about $100 million and I don't know how many weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and additional training doesn't really work well. I mean, you have catastrophic forgetting, um, the buffer, is not integrated, the context buffer is not integrated. So the fact that they're pre-trained, uh, they're bulk trained, um, is, is really a killer. You know, I mean, imagine hiring somebody as an assistant 
and they come to you and they can do Excel and they can do QuickBooks and, you know, they know a bunch of things. Uh, okay, they, they sometimes make some really bad mistakes, you know, but <laughs> let's ignore that for now. But so you, you tell them, you know, we're just taking on some new products. I've got a new partnership here. We're shutting down one of our branches and, you know, a few other things happen in our business. Next day they come in, they don't remember a thing hmm. about that, you know, yeah. uh, not that's not intelligence so um you know that problem really has you know cannot be addressed by building bigger models and the the gpt the t the transformer um really locks them into this but the problem is transformers have been so incredibly successful in so many areas i mean what gpt can do is amazing you know it really is amazing so they're kind of locked into by by their own success and they really need need to somehow tear themselves away. Um, and the the other issue why I say a cognitive AI is really the way to go, and why I, I think the the current leaders in the field with statistical AI are unlikely to actually um, achieve AGI, is because their backgrounds are inherently statistics. They're mathematicians, statisticians, logicians. You know, that's the way they they see intelligence. They basically see, hey, we've got all this data, we've got this computing power, we've got computers that can do certain things. What can we do with that? How can we use our human intelligence to make these things do amazing things like become world chess champions or go champions or do protein folding or whatever? But these are all really narrow AIs that rely on the external, the ongoing external intelligence of of, of humans to to make them work, uh, you really need to start with uh, cognition, with cognitive, you know, understanding intelligence, and say we absolutely need these. These are the following requirements to build an intelligent system. And if your system doesn't have that, it's not going to ultimately be intelligent. Do you do you follow how uh, Shane Leg and and uh, Ben Gertzel are, are pursuing AGI? Uh, yes, and um, somewhat. Um, I, I was just at the AGI conference, the annual AGI conference uh, in Stockholm, and you know, caught, caught up with with Ben. Uh, his, his current focus seems to be more on a sort of uh, society of mind, not in the Marvin Minskyan sense, uh, or at least not in my opinion. But that a lot of narrow AIs, is, you know, a society of narrow AIs, will give you. AGI, which I, I disagree with. I don't believe that's the right path, but that's the path he seems to be pursuing. Um, Shane Legg has, uh, you know, has actually not published much over the last 10 years that I'm aware of, but he recently uh, did give an interview and published something um, that seems to be relying very much on reinforcement learning, mm. which to me does not, you know, it's kind of the opposite of learning with, you know, one shot learning, basically. And I mean, reinforcement learning has its place, but I think it's a relatively minor one. And to believe that you can solve human level intelligence with reinforcement learning seems seems like a stretch to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and, and Ben's ideas that these uh, narrow AIs would talk to each other or there would be an orchestration layer that would uh, sort of direct queries to whichever one had the domain expertise is that? Right. I mean, that orchestration layer, unless that is an AGI, in which case that's what you should be focusing yeah. on. So you want your AGI to be a tool user like humans are. That's a you know, big power that we, we have. So you want an AGI to be able, if you know, I ask my AGI to write a poem in the style of Jimi Hendrix or whatever, um, you know, it should probably go to uh, GPT or a, G a large language model and see, you know, give me a few, give me a few suggestions uh, from there. Or if I, you know, wanted to play a game of chess, could probably just use a chess program for that. I wouldn't expect it. So an AGI needs to be a tool user in, inherently and be good at that. So that orchestrator, the problem with narrow AI is that it's really not AI because it 
in in the, the original sense of AI, and that's why we coined the term artificial general intelligence to recapture the original dream of AI to have thinking machines. Narrow AI inherently has external intelligence. It uses the programmer's intelligence. And a perfect example of that is, is you know, Deep Blue, for example, the hmm. world chess champion. It's not that the system itself has intelligence. No, it's the ingenuity of the engineers on how to use algorithms that could, you know, do the, the branching and uh, uh, whatever logic logic they used and heuristics they used and encoded to, to play a mean game of chess. So the narrow AI is, is really not intelligent. And putting a whole bunch of narrow AIs together, again, they, they cannot learn, they cannot conceptualize, they, they don't have general intelligence, they don't have intelligence. So ha having a whole bunch of specialized intelligent uh, AIs could be good as tools, but not as solving the problem of, of AGI. Yeah. Uh, your uh, system, so you're talking about uh, using the same architecture, but uh, growing it. Uh, in, and is that, uh, to, to, to reach AGI, is that, uh, is, is that growth uh, through uh, adding uh, modalities uh, or or the ability to uh, to uh, input data from different modalities uh, wh wh what's the the bottleneck in in that yeah so there there are a number of areas that that we we need to um, add the one of them is that language capability we've really um, put that into the system through language rules, you know, grammar rules mm -hmm. and so on. Um, with the the new version that we're work, working on right now, uh, is language will actually be acquired by interacting with the environment. And we can do that because we have a visual sense now as well. We have visual sense input and mm -hmm. mouse, mouse movement and so on. So the system can actually have these grounded concepts and can learn language from, from, from the ground up. So that's one of the, the big differences, which basically makes the system more adaptive. I've actually, over the years, I've always said when customers have asked us, you know, when can we have it in another language uh, other than English? Uh, I said, well, ideally when I go smart enough to learn a language by itself, mm -hmm. because we don't want to have to encode different language rules for different languages. And, you know, large language models, of course, solve that problem by brute force with, you know, st statistics. Um, so, uh, so basically, the, making the system more adaptive, that it can learn more things and can learn them better than it can now. At the moment, there's still quite a bit of human in the loop for the system to learn anything, to learn new skills or to learn, um, you know, a, a different concept. There's, there's too much of a human in the loop for many things. Uh, it can learn by itself quite a bit, but not as much as it should. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also new skills. Uh, again, our system can learn skills autonomously uh, or through language instruction, but that needs to become more powerful. We also simply need to expand its knowledge base, you know, that we, we spoke about. And that will involve scaling, you know, going from a few million concepts to, you know, tens or hundreds of millions. But that's pretty much a straightforward engineering uh, engineering issue. So it's really the... Um, the generality of the system by giving it a broader knowledge base, the adaptability and autonomy that it can learn more autonomously, that it can learn with less human uh, human in the loop. So that's yep. where our focus is. But it's all um, it's it's really all incremental type of work, you know, of work we've done either in the past or is is already in our current system. Yeah, the uh, human in the loop. What what are the different functions that that humans are playing? Yeah, so in in our current commercial system, it's basically we um, you know we had humans create all of all of the language rules required. So that that was hu a human in the loop. Um, in terms of the specific uh, skills that it that it needed, um, and you know. I mean, contrasting that with what an AGI needs to do and what the, the, the new generation, the next generation of our technology will do, 
it, it really should be able to go to a customer and, and say, you know, what are the specifications? Give me your training manuals. You know, I need your API documentation and then configure itself, basically. So that's ultimately the direction we need to be moving in and to have less and less of a human in the loop to, to you know, to basically feed it that information. And the, the training process I, I, I spoke about is basically building up a curriculum to give it that core knowledge. Think of it like a child, you get to a certain age where it can learn largely by itself. And then it'll need less and less of human assistance or it knows who, who to ask for help to, you know, when it's stuck or uh, clarif needs clarification. And that's where metacognition comes in, that the system uh, knows what it knows or knows what it doesn't know and can monitor its own thought process and, you know, level off certainty and confusion. Uh, so that's, again, an important element missing in large language models is metacognition. They don't have any metacognition. And that's, you know, that's a part of our system that we also are developing further. Yeah. Uh, your system uh, is certainly much uh, more compute efficient than a large language model. What a typical system for a uh, Fortune 500 enterprise. Mm -hmm. What what uh, is it running on? GPUs, CPUs. Yeah, How, um, yeah. very very little processing uh, power. So you can run our system uh, an agent. You can run on you know five year old laptop or something. Hmm. So um, typically we you know, we run them on you know uh, machines in in the cloud cloud clusters. And, you know, we'll run um, one conversation per CPU. Um, and this is a server CPU. It's not particularly high performance. So they really need a trivial amount of processing power to operate. And on the training side, um, you know, we'll retrain our whole system several times a day for our regression tests to develop new things or test new features or whatever. And, I mean, you literally the training cost is pennies. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's it's completely trivial. Now, of course, once we scale our system up to, you know, millions of concepts, that'll that'll be a bit more. But hey, if it costs a hundred dollars to train a system, it's still a lot than a hundred million. Yeah, that's right. The uh, how how far do you think you are from scaling this up? Yes, to to um, to a, to a degree that's approaching uh, human level intelligence. Yes, I, I think there'll, there'll be a time when it becomes really, really obvious to pretty much anybody who works with a system saying, wow, this is the real thing. It really can learn by itself, you know, and it still needs a bit more. How long will it take us to get there? Well, I, I usually answer that question. It's not a matter of time. It's a matter of money yeah. <laughs> because it really is. I mean, we a lot of the research we we did many, many years ago, and it's really more a question of having the people to do the development that needs to be done. And But, you know, I'm actually quite confident if we didn't have a constraint in terms of people that, you know, we can do this in three years um, hmm. in that sort of time frame. But, you know, we we really need, you know, 100, 100 or so people on the project for the various things that need to be improved and tuned and scaled. Um, and that's what we're in the process right now of, of trying to raise, uh, raise funds for that to increase our team, team size to accelerate the development because with our current 30-person team, uh, we have a, about a third of the people working on the AGI project, but two-thirds are working on the, com on the commercial side. And um, have you, are you working with the government at all? I mean, there's been such a push uh, and and so much money made available. Are are any of those programs helping fund you? Um, no, uh, I mean, I've I have had really bad experience with it, and other people I've spoken about that, as usual, government money just tends to end up in the wrong hands. Um, you know, we've we've had people. I mean, I've applied for these programs, and then you know they say this is for innovation. You know, to and then they ask you, well, how many projects have you done before? 
okay if it's supposed to be innovation you know you have <laughs> like a factory of innovation or something mm -hmm. and you know do you have a department that knows how to to you know has all the right connections and so um you know and then you try and work with consultants and say okay pay me thirty thousand dollars a month and i'll put you in front of the right senator and yeah no <laughs> um I, I mean i don't have any in, inherent objection uh but i you know i've not had a good experience with trying to play that game yeah yeah that's unfortunate um uh, so so you're raising money now uh if you get the money we're within uh of several years of of achieving something close to human level intelligence yeah i believe and in the meantime yeah who who are the uh the customers for igo as it exists today yes the simplest uh, way to categorize it is really any company that has um, a call center um, of 100 people or more. I mean, that's sort of where the economics become really interesting um, because we could probably, you know, replace 50% of, of the people. Um, so if they're growing, they don't need to build bigger call centers or get additional uh, people. And, you know, call centers are really suffering. I mean, we hear that everywhere. They're really struggling to keep staff, to train them, uh, to get them, keep train them and keep them. Uh, it's tremendous turnover and the quality is all over the place usually. So uh, that that's sort of at the moment the most obvious customer uh, profile. But, you know, we, we're also talking to universities as a student assistant. You know, when you first go to university, for example, find your way around. You know, where do I get meals and books and curriculum and, you know, all, all this stuff help you with studies and so on. So that we're very excited about being able to do that. We're hoping to get a project like that off the ground soon. Um, or diabetes code, you know, for somebody who has diabetes and they want something to help them manage it. Uh, internal uh, HR support for a large company or IT support would also be an application. Um, and the an, another area is uh, what, what we call a co-pilot. So for complex software, uh, where people don't know how to use all of the features in the software, it's awkward to use it, you know, like Salesforce or SAP. Uh, it's really difficult to know how to use all the features, or they may be hard to use. If you can have an IGO as a front end uh, to that and just talk to it and tell it what you want done, it can basically then either navigate you to the place or in some some cases even just execute, do whatever you want want to do it. So that we're really industry agnostic and to a large extent application agnostic in terms of anywhere where conversational AI can uh, can can help. Yeah. And and how do you uh, price your products? Uh, I mean we we're fairly flexible so but typically it's per per conversation. Now we you know we may have a different rate for uh, fully contained conversation if it's a call center application. So if it's totally successful, maybe a, you know a, a premium for that. But we we can you know we work with customers. It can potentially also be per seat, but usually performance based. We like that model because it's a win win situation. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, it is. Uh, do you do you find the the competitive landscape these days? difficult because uh, the chatbots, the GPT chatbots have, have kind of taken over? Uh, uh, yes, it's certainly a, a, a short-term uh, challenge. Oh, by the way, the one thing I forgot to mention is we deploy this behind the customer's firewall, you know, which, right. which they love. So we're not a SaaS service. We provide our technology and it just runs on their, usually on their cloud service or on, you know, whatever hardware they have, uh, we just deployed as a Kubernetes uh, service. Um, so uh, yes, when ChatGPT 4, is, in particular 3.5, ChatGPT hit, hit, you know, hit the news, um, you know, a, a lot of our prospects that we had lined up that were ready to go with us, you know, management said, wow, isn't this going to do everything that you guys do? And we've got to investigate that, you know. And some of them have started coming back to us and said, yeah, we've investigated it. And no, it can't, can't do anything like that. You know, it can be good for FAQs. It can help with search, you know, like it can, if you can uh, 
train it with you know all of the documents you have in your company it can certainly help you answer questions about them as long again as you have a human in the loop to verify that this actually makes makes sense uh, but as far as having customer conversations that you need to be able to rely on and that need to be deeply integrated with your your backend services and have business rules um, you know, and, and things that are reliable enough that your legal system will sign off, your marketing department will sign off, and your customer experience team will sign off on it. Um, you know, large language models simply don't meet that requirement. So we're starting to see those prospects come back to us after they've investigated, uh, you know, large language models. Yeah. Uh, and just a question on the on using graph databases. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, people using vector databases with uh, large language models to ground the large language model in, in uh, you know, a, a, a knowledge base. Uh, do you use vector databases at all? And uh, could you apply or integrate that kind of a solution with IGO where you have a large language model and either the it queries the knowledge uh, graph or or a vector database to 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 compile its answers. Yeah, no, you really can't integrate the two technologies for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Is you really need deep integration. I mean, every new thing that you hear, you know, if you have a product, new product, or something changes in your life that needs to be an integral part. It needs to immediately update your model and it may have significant impact on, you know, how you respond to, to future queries. You know, you, you have another child or, you know, whatever, you move to a different town or whatever. It, it has to immediately up, up, uh, update everything. Um, and as far as using uh, graph databases, we actually in a white paper I just recently published on um, on how to get to AGI, uh, most, uh, most direct route to, to AGI. Uh, we did some benchmarking and the one benchmark we did was against the uh, state-of-the-art graph database. And um, our, our system was a, a thousand times faster and you know that's what I mentioned earlier, and and you really can't have that kind of performance uh, penalty. Um, so it, you know if it's again if it's if the system can use it as a tool as an external service via an API to mm -hmm. to do something, absolutely. I mean, same as the system can query an external database, uh, but to be an integral part of of the brain, that just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we're coming up to to an hour. I I, I just want to ask on the personal, personal, personal. I go. <laughs> uh, how far off is that? I mean, I can imagine having everybody having uh, this uh, this this personal uh, assistant y yes. uh, that learns as you learn over time. Yeah, I, I know people get excited about and always ask us, when can I have one? Can I be a beta tester and so on? Um, again, unfortunately, the answer it really de depends on dollars rather than, um, you know, months or years. Uh, I mean, certainly um, it, it'll be at least a year uh, before our, tech, the, the, our new generation, our next generation of the technology, uh, you know, is, is, is ready for prime time. Um, but... I don't expect it to be much longer than that, provided we, you know, we get the funding uh, lined up pretty soon. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's fascinating. I'll I'll look forward to that. Is there anything that that I didn't touch on uh, that that you wanted to say or that that we talked about last time that I don't remember? Yeah, I, th I think the, the, the thing that uh, really surprises me, and I, I published a white paper um, two months ago, so why don't we have AGI yet? I and the that. thing that surprises yeah, me, it, the thing that surprises me is that there aren't more people in the world who really take that question seriously. You know, with the, the billions and billions of dollars being thrown at AI, um, and people just blindly go ahead, you know, sheep following 
um, FOMO setting in, well, we don't know which of these companies are going to succeed. Nobody's got a moat. Maybe the best moat is money. You know, if we give them yeah. 10, if we give them 100 billion, then maybe they've got a moat uh, that other people can't compete with them. Uh, and, you know, on the one hand, they all freely admit this technology is not going to get us to AGI. And, but why aren't you asking the question, well, why and what will take uh, what will it take and i've i've tried to get together um people to just brainstorm you know even sharing ideas of what we've learned what works what doesn't learn you know quite op quite openly in terms of sharing sharing ideas to make this happen because yes we'd like to to have a trillion dollar company with agi and we expect to but to me it's more important to for humanity to have agi because I think it will so much improve the quality of life of, of everyone in, in the world, potentially. And so, you know, that, that really baffles me that we don't have more people really asking the question of what do we know and what, what, you know, what doesn't make sense? And should we be doing more things that don't make sense? What are the things that maybe do make sense and, and you know, fund them? It's such a, such a monoculture, basically. Uh, yeah. At, at the moment, so th that that's uh, that's a bit baffling. And I mean, apart from that, it's just obviously I'd love to hear from people who want to use our technology commercially, and more importantly, we are looking for for partners, uh, people who want to work with us on developing AGI, um, collaborate in some way, and and of course also for people who want to to fund that and maybe make that part of their legacy. This episode is sponsored by Datastax, the real-time AI company. With Datastax, any enterprise can mobilize real-time data and quickly build smart, high-growth applications at unlimited scale on any cloud. Companies building real-time generative AI apps can leverage the Datastax vector search capabilities to build LLMs, AI assistance, and more. Sign up now at the link in our show notes. That's it for this week's episode. I want to thank Peter for his time. If you want to read a transcript of this conversation, you can find one on our website, I on AI, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. In the meantime, remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is changing your world, so pay attention.